All right, so last day I gave you guys uh, a question where basically what you need to do then is rank these things in boiling point. Quantum mark, let's see, file 103. Before we can even do that, though, we should probably draw these molecules because our goal is to figure out what sort of forces exist between them. So, do you guys remember what ammonia is? Good, NH3. Right. So hopefully you're getting a little bit quicker at drawing NH3, but it would look something like this is a Lewis dot diagram. Here's N to H like that. That's, that's the Lewis dot diagram for ammonia. Anybody know what shape it's going to have? Like in terms of the five main shapes you have to know? Good job. Yeah, it's the pyramid. Yeah, if I were to draw ammonia in 3D, it would be M H H H. So that's ammonia. Uh, technically, there's a lone pair up here. Normally in stereochemical drawings, lone pairs are sometimes skipped. Um, for sure, you got to include them in Lewis dot diagrams. Though. Does that work so far? All right, let's try the next one. Phosphorus tribromide. Well, phosphorus is P. Actually, why don't I draw it up here to start? P, and it's got five valence electrons. So with it having five valence electrons, it'll go one, two, three, four, five, which means it has three places it can make a bond. Uh, there's one, there's two, there's three. What shape will this guy have? Same thing. Uh, pyramid though, not planar. How do you tell them? Lone pair. The lone pair requires space. So if it bonds like, say, this, C, O, 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 that's the planar. But if it were to bond like, say, C, O, 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 and there's a lone pair there. That doesn't actually make sense. I have too many bonds. But the lone pair makes it a pyramid. That makes sense. Whereas this one doesn't have a lone pair sitting there. There's too many bonds on that one anyways. Okay, so if I were to draw the phosphorus tribromide, it would look like this. Lone pair, bromine, bromine, bromine. How am I doing so far? Is this something you guys can do? Okay, cool. Moving on. Methane. CH4. If I were to draw methane, I might just go right to this diagram. C H four. There we go. What shape does methane have? Tetrahedral. Good job. <laughs> Tetrahedral. Four, four directions. All right. Last one's a bit trickier. Ethane. First question, does anybody know ethane's molecular formula? Thank you. Ethane is C2H6, which makes it a bit trickier to draw. Um, if I were to draw this carbon here and this carbon here, it probably makes a lot of sense to bond them together. And then there's six leftover bonds. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There. That's kind of what C2H6 looks like. Um, this is not a dot diagram, though, or a uh, stereochemical. This is called that Kekulé structural formula. So I might want to try to draw this one in 3D. That's a little trickier. I might recommend doing this. Start with both of the carbons as being flush in the plane. And maybe like both of the up hydrogens, the same thing. Maybe make this one go off like that and that. And then do the same sort of thing for this one. Make this one go out and in. Um, I've often heard of ethane being referred to kind of as a, um, what do you call those um, like um, saw horses that you do construction on? You guys know what I'm talking about there? So it's got like the two legs. Saw horses like its name? Okay. Where it's got like the two legs and then the bar across the middle. I don't know that you can kind of picture this, but this is like a leg coming outwards. This is a leg coming outwards. That is a leg going into the page and into the page. And then this would be where you'd do your work. You'd have to kind of ignore those hydrogens, I guess. I've heard of that thing described as a sawhorse. Okay, now that I've drawn all these molecules and taken a long time to do so, I want to talk about the three different types of forces that keep different molecules together. Actually, the two types of forces. One of the forces, eh, what am I doing here, is called a London force. Everything has London forces. 
you guys remember what eleven force is, though? The best definition is probably called a temporary dipole. The idea being that bigger molecules have more electrons, and if they have more electrons, electrons don't actually exist in like orbits where they have to stay. Electrons can go wherever the heck they want. There's a possibility then that there could be more electrons on one side than the other, just for a split second. So long story short, bigger molecules, which means like more electrons, means more London forces. London forces, though, are temporary dipoles. They're, they're quite weak. The second type of force is called a dipole force. Someone mind grabbing that door? Maybe even the back one, too. Thanks, guys. And this is based on whether molecules are polar or not. So if a molecule is polar, it always has a dipole, rather than like occasionally. So now my goal is to go through all of these different molecules and rank them based on their forces. So let's start with this first one here. Is it polar or non-polar? How do I even know? It's not polar. We can tell by looking at our bonds who wins the electron fight between nitrogen and hydrogen. I think nitrogen wins. And it wins that one, and it wins that one. Do all of these arrows balance each other, though? No. no. All right, so that makes this one polar. And this one right here kind of has the <coughs> same principles. Although, actually, I think I have them wrong. I think that uh, technically bromine wins. Not that it really matters, but do these arrows balance each other? No. So that one's polar. Morning. Whereas in this one right here, I believe carbon wins the fight for electrons ever so slightly. But here's the difference. Now there's four arrows all pushing inward equally. So even though there are non-polar, you know, even though there are polar bonds within the molecule, this molecule on a whole is non-polar due to symmetry. Does that make sense? Due to symmetricalness of this molecule, it's actually going to be non-polar. Um, who wins in this bond right here between carbon and carbon? Good. We call that a non-polar covalent bond. Nobody wins that fight. But in terms of all of the rest of these ones, would it kind of make sense that due to symmetry, since everybody's kind of pushing inwards, this molecule here, even though there are many polar bonds, this one's also nonpolar. So that'll help me figure out in rough order which ones are higher than the other ones. These two will be the lowest two. No. These two will be the highest two. These two will be the lowest two. How do I break a tie? London force. So even though some of these things some can have some, mom some regular dipoles, they could also have momentary dipoles. And that's based on electrons. So nitrogen brings seven electrons total, and then each hydrogen brings one. So this guy has 10 electrons. Whereas phosphorus brings 15 electrons, and each bromine brings 35. Holy smokes, that's a lot. 50, 120? Well, bromine's got 35, and we need three of those, so 35 mm -hmm. times three, and then 15 for phosphorus. What'd you get, 120? Okay. Which one of these two molecules, then, has higher London force? This guy right here, it's got way more electrons. Uh, between these guys right here, carbon has six, each hydrogen has one, so I can do that, that's 10. Whereas this guy right here, there's two carbons each at six, so that's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. You guys good? Uh, so last step, let's rank these things. Who should have the lowest amount of force keeping these things together? No, you're actually on the other side here. That has the most amount of force. Yeah, CH4, because this one is nonpolar, so therefore there's no reason for it to stick to another molecule. And it also only has 10 electrons. So that doesn't even give very many London force. So methane is the lowest. Who's next lowest? It's ethane. Why? Well, it's also nonpolar. So it has no reason to stick together. But it's slightly better than this guy right here, just because it has more electrons. So it wins the London forces. So I would expect that ethane is next. <coughs> then these guys should have the highest amount of intermolecular forces. Who wins them? 
Well, they're both polar, but one of them has way higher London forces. So this guy right here, the Trosphorus tri tribromide, should be the stronger between these two guys right here. Does that make sense? Sorry, that makes sense? Because, I mean, they're both polar, but this guy right here has way more electrons than this guy does here. So therefore, it has more London force. Does that make sense? Okay. Then for our last lesson, this is actually wrong. I've lied to you. <laughs> because there is something we haven't considered, which is the third type of force, and it has been poorly named. You guys with me? Make sure you listen. This is super important. Okay, it's called a hydrogen bond. It is a very poor choice of name because it's not actually a bond. It's probably better to call it a force. It's what keeps this molecule attracted to this molecule. That's not actually a bond. It's more of a force of attraction. But the third thing is a hydrogen bond. And this guy right here is actually capable of forming a hydrogen bond, which is why it's gonna get bumped to the top automatically. If anything can hydrogen bond, hydrogen bonds are actually the strongest of all of the intermolecular forces we know. Okay. Um, last day we talked about what are called the van der Waal forces. I mentioned the idea that like if you ever come up with something scientific and you get to name it, you can name it after yourself, like van der Waal did. Uh, the first two forces in purple are known as van der Waal forces. And up until like the early 1900s, so like the 20th century, like literally we're talking less than 100 years ago, this is all we knew of. And they could not figure out for the life of them how to explain why this guy right here actually had a higher boiling point than this guy. Because based on the evidence they had, they knew this one was higher than this one. But based on like their theories and the way they were drawing molecules, they couldn't figure out the reason why. And then hydrogen bonding came along. So let me talk about this. A hydrogen bond, and you may want to write this down in your data booklet somewhere, occurs under only very, very specific circumstances. It needs a hydrogen atom covalently attached to something that is very electronegative. So there's actually only four things that I've ever heard of that can actually <coughs> hydrogen bond. And those four things are fluorine, which is 4.0, uh, chlorine, which I believe is 3.2. Uh, actually, bromine cannot hydrogen bond, as far as I've ever heard of. Uh, oxygen can, though, because that's 3.4. And uh, nitrogen can also hydrogen bond, which I think is 3.2. Is that right? Do I have that right? 3.2? 3.0, okay. These are the only four things, at least to the best of my understanding, and that's what we're going to base this off of here, that have the capacity to hydrogen bond. They have to be super electronegative. And these things have to be attached to hydrogen. Okay. Here's what ends up happening. The electrons are pulled so far towards the electronegative atom, so one of these four, that the hydrogen nucleus is exposed. Okay. You guys remember the analogy? Nice. Okay, you guys remember the analogy I've given before of how like covalent bonding is kind of like sharing a bed with somebody, with the idea that like someone is going to steal the covers. The covers being the analogy for the electrons. Okay. Um, in hydrogen bonding, is it still sharing? Ugh, yeah, kind of. But like, we are talking the extremes here, where, uh, where the fluorine, chlorine, oxygen, nitrogen, one of those four guys, they are stealing the electrons, the covers, pretty, pretty badly. Does that make sense? Which kind of leaves hydrogen exposed, if I want to use my fingers. Exposed. Does that make sense? Well, what is hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is made up of, right, right here. Hydrogen is made up of one proton and one electron. What happens if you steal its only electron? All you've got left is a proton. Okay. And that leaves it very, I, I like to use that word, exposed, very naked. It's all up there by itself. So like, for example, here is a good example of something that can hydrogen bond. This is water. Okay. This is oxygen. This is hydrogen. And although we draw bonds like a little stick here, what is that stick really representing? Two electrons. Who has those electrons? Uh, oxygen has those electrons. It's really kind of stealing them. Is it full-on theft like ionic bonds are? No. But it's pretty close. 
it means that this hydrogen right here is basically an exposed proton. That's useful in bonding, because what do positive things like to attract to? Negative things. <laughs> so here's the thing. That is one requirement. Requirement one is that it has to be hydrogen attached to one of these four. But there has to be one more thing. There also has to be a lone pair somewhere. Because lone pairs are free electrons that are literally doing nothing. They're not part of bonding. They're still there, obviously, right? They're taking up space. But a positive hydrogen nucleus, which is a proton, would be very attracted to anything that's negative. So any lone pairs could then have an attraction. And if you guys remember how to draw water, water is usually drawn like HOH. And you put some lone pairs on the oxygen to make it bend. Well, there are lone pairs right here, meaning this, this positive right here could become very attracted to that negative lone pair. I'm going to say this a lot of times today, though. Is this really a bond? That's really a poor choice of word. Yeah, it's a force of attraction. It's, a, it's an electrostatic force, basically. Positives and negatives will attract each other. Is it a bond in the same way that this thing right here is a bond or this thing right here is a bond? No. I would say it's probably best to call bonds the things that are inside of molecules. We call those intramolecular. Whereas things that keep this molecule and this molecule stuck together, that's probably better described as a force. So even though we call it a hydrogen bond, it's probably a poor choice of word. So I'm just going to read through some of my notes here. I try not to read everything off of it. You guys can read this yourself. It's a misleading term. They don't actually form a bond. Think of them like magnets. This positive attracts that lone pair negative. More pictures. One of the cool things about hydrogen bonds then is they can actually really form together and like stick together in like a lot of three-dimensional type shapes. We've used the term before, a crystal lattice, to describe how things ionically bond. Um, things that can hydrogen bond often have very similar shapes to crystal lattices. Rather than it being like positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative though, it doesn't quite work quite the same way, but do you see how like this hydrogen could bond to that oxygen's lone pair? But each oxygen actually has two lone pairs. So then the other lone pair could bond to this hydrogen. Does that make sense? It's kind of, kind of unique about water. Water has two hydrogens, so it can hydrogen bond in two directions. It also has two lone pairs. So rather than just making one hydrogen bond, it can actually make multiple hydrogen bonds, and it sticks <coughs> together very nicely. Um, again, lots of diagrams. I'll move on. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes chlorine. Those are the only four things that can do this. Um, found another diagram here. See how this hydrogen right here is attached to that nitrogen right there? That means this hydrogen is essentially a positive proton. Now take a look at this nitrogen right here, though. How many lines are drawn out of it? Well, only three. That doesn't make sense. Well, where's the extra set of electron? Extra set of like electrons? Well, it's a it's a lone pair right there. That makes sense. Meaning that this positive can attack one of those electrons in the lone pair. I want to give a good example though of something that can't hydrogen bond. Can methane hydrogen bond? Okay, for a couple of reasons. Does it have hydrogen in it? Sure, it does. But is that hydrogen attached to a nitrogen or oxygen or something like that? No. Second thing, does it have a lone pair? No. Well, then it can't. Make sense? Okay. Let me give you another example here. C, F, H, H, H. Can this guy hydrogen bond? I would say no, it can't. Because although there's a hydrogen, is the hydrogen actually attached to the fluorine? That's probably the most common mistake kids make sometimes when I put in distractors. Is they say, hey, look, there's a hydrogen, there's a fluorine. It can hydrogen bond. Now, this hydrogen has to be attached to the chlorine, not to the carbon. There's also one more problem. We don't have any lone pairs. Let me draw one more. Nitrogen to fluorine and hydrogen. That has a lone pair. But is this hydrogen right here attached to something that can? Actually, yes, it can. Because this hydrogen is attached to a nitrogen. But what if I did this? What if I made it go to phosphorus? Fluorine, fluorine. Then I would say no. Because even though there is a hydrogen, 
and there is a lone pair, and there is a fluorine, the hydrogen actually has to be attached to either the fluorine oxygen nitrogen chloride. Does that make sense? Cool. To be honest, that's it. I've kind of just been holding out on hydrogen bonding to kind of split things up. But if something can hydrogen bond, it rockets right to the top of the list. So in terms of a ranking, and I think I have a ranking on one of my last slides here. So I'm going to skip ahead here in summary. Here. In terms of a ranking, if something can hydrogen bond, put it right into first place. Then if it has dipoles, but it can't hydrogen bond, that's kind of in the middle. And if you ever need to break a tie, use London forces. Now all three of these things here are known as intermolecular. But I want to point out there are some other types of attraction force bonds that we should talk about. Those are the ionic and covalent bonds that happen inside a molecule. Okay, which is stronger between ionic and covalent? Do you guys remember? It's covalent. Now there's a couple of ways I remember this. Ionic involves like giving and taking electrons, whereas covalent involves sharing. And everyone learned in kindergarten that sharing is caring. So therefore sharing is better. But if that doesn't work, I have another way of remembering it here. It's actually kind of easy sometimes to break an, ion ion break an ionic bond. To break an ionic bond, put it in water. Does that make sense? Covalent things, like say um, carbon dioxide or oxygen or something like that, covalently bonded things don't just fall apart when you put them in water. But solid crystals of ionic substances do. So if we were to continue this list, the next thing up would be the ionic bond. And then the last thing would be the covalent. But keep in mind, these two things right here are actually intra bonds within the molecule. London forces involve temporary, occasional, random, once in a blue moon charges. They last for a brief second. Dipoles are partial charges. They always, they're, they're permanent, but they're not like full on positives and negatives. They're like partial positive, partial negative. And we use the symbol partial positive, partial negative. Hydrogen bond is a little bit better, but it only happens under very unique circumstances. And it pretty much is like an ionic bond, except it's kind of rare. Ionic bonds have like complete positives and negatives. Uh, do you guys remember what sort of forces hold ionic bonds together, what the name of it was called? Uh, like electro Good, electrostatic forces keep ionic bonds together. They don't have partial positives and negatives, they have full positives and negatives. Because there's like theft or transfer of electrons. Okay. And then finally, the strongest of all of the bonds forces we're going to talk about is an internal covalent bond where they share their electrons. Because sharing is caring. All right. So. I have two main goals for this unit. Hopefully I accomplish these. Let's walk through them. First goal, can you draw molecules in three dimensions? And I guess going along with that, do you know what sort of shapes they have? Okay. Second goal, using that information, can you now try to explain why some things are solid, some things are liquid, some things are gases, based on all of these forces we just talked about? <coughs> if you can do that, that's basically the gist of the unit. I think I'll leave her there, because I've covered everything. If, if not, make sure you read through the notes, obviously. I'm not going to read off the of slides for you. But I'm done. That's our year. So two last thoughts, and you guys can go take a break and do whatever. So thought one, just to rehash. Guys, you have a final exam in like 10 minutes. I'm not the kind of teacher who's going to make you sit down and do stuff. I never have been. I probably never will be. But you should. You should stop talking while I'm talking and actually like pay attention. I can't make you, but you should. Because this is pretty big. You've only got a week left. Second thing, before we even get to that though, I need to give you some grades on other stuff. Here's the list. It's getting pretty short. I'm going to cross it off as we need to. Work on the bonding assignment. If you haven't printed that off, print it off, get started. Work on the lab. I want this Friday. No later than Friday. I only have a little brief window to mark them, okay? Um, quiz number two is tomorrow. The unit test is Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to do some studying. And then next week, Thursday, is your final exam. Last thought to go along with the stuff on that list. If I don't have progress logs for you, I cannot give you a grade. Okay, I handed back all the progress logs I had. If you haven't given me a progress log for stuff, give it to me. I have a few starting for stoichiometry. Okay. Here, here's the deal, guys. If you don't want to do a progress log, you don't have to. It just means I calculate your grades like every other teacher would. 
which means I just put them all in the processor, and then it spits out a number. And I'm starting to put in zeros, which means grades look bad. It is always to your advantage to do a progress log. I promise you. I mean, your grades look pretty good usually, especially if you get to throw out your worst marks. I know it's getting kind of late for this sort of stuff here, but I mean, this is why I want to do progress logs, because I want to encourage you guys to do all of your assignments, do them on time, so that you can throw out your worst grades. Okay. So for this last unit here, in the bonding unit, since we're going to do a unit test, two quizzes, and uh, the assignment and the, and the um, lab, doing five things, you can get rid of two. You can only get rid of two if you actually hand them all in. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, I'm done talking. You guys have the next hour. Do something. Let me know how I can help you guys. But don't waste it, okay? Because we're rapidly running out of time.